if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 9. <clears throat> we'll have our special song when I get done tonight. What do you think about that? Turn things around a little bit. Hebrews 9 <clears throat> and verse number 1. The Scripture says, Then verily the first covenant, note carefully, first covenant, had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made with the first, wherein was the candlestick, the table, the showbread, which is called a sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, ark of the covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying the way into the holiest of all, was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Father, bless your holy word now as it goes forth. In thy name we pray. Amen. The book of Hebrews, of many of the things that it does, gives a contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And it's very important to understand that because the writer of the book of Hebrews lays great emphasis upon the fact that he's contrasting the Old Covenant with the New. Look at verse 15, Hebrews 9. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. The word testament is diatheke, translated covenant in other places. And, of course, I've had taught on that at many times as to why the word testament is used here and not covenant. But in Hebrews 9.15, he talks about the new covenant. Now look at chapter number 8 and verse number 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So the apostle tells you plainly that the first covenant had fault. He's telling you that it was not perfect. And he tells you here, as I just read in chapter number 9, verse 9, that the conscience could never be made perfect. In plainer words, after the sacrifice was offered to God and all the rituals were performed, that they still had a sense of guilt about their sins that they'd committed. Now, that, well, that's going to have an effect in your relationship with the Lord. That's going to have a direct effect in your communion with God. It's going to affect the way you walk before God because you're constantly going to be reminded by the devil. And make no mistake, he'll remind you. We have, that's why we, the Bible said we have an advocate with the Father, 1 John chapter number 3. He, 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 the reason you can't do this is because the, because the conscience is not clean. The reason the conscience is not clean is because the sins have not been washed away. All of the blood of bulls and goats and all of the rituals and all of the law and all the covenants and all the commandments and all of that in the Old Testament could not take your sins away. And the writer of the book of Hebrews, time and time and time again, calls that to your attention. Now, there's something odd about the giving of the law in the Old Testament. I want you to look with me in the book of uh, Galatians, chapter number 3, and verse number 19. It feels good to be back up here doing something. Amen. <laughs> Galatians, chapter number 3, and verse 19. Now, watch this. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, now watch this, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Angels were directly involved in the giving of the law. Look at Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 2. Hebrews 2.2. 2. Now this raises a very important thing. Hebrews 2.2. 2. Hebrews 2.2. 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. What about that? Angels directly associated with the giving of the law. Look at Acts chapter number 7, verse number 53. Acts seven fifty-three. 
The Bible said, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So there's no question that the Bible bears out the fact that angels were directly involved in the giving of the law. Now, there's a great controversy among the uh, scholars and teachers and so forth as to exactly what their role was. What were they doing? Why did God have angels involved in the giving of the law? <coughs> what part did they play? We cannot answer that very clearly uh, to, to, to everybody's satisfaction. But we can answer it this way as far as we know. They were directly involved and they were speaking. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 32, the Lord showed up with ten thousands of his saints and issued forth the fiery law. Now this is an Old Testament reference to the giving of the law. And it says in the fact that it was fiery, it went forth. Now you know that the law was written in stone. And you know that the law was written by the finger of God. Cecil B. DeMille got it right in the Ten Commandments. If you've ever watched that, you'll see a fiery finger write, in the, write the law into the Ten Commandments. So angels are involved in the giving of the law. But now when it comes to the New Covenant, an angel has nothing to do with it. It's a completely different matter. And this is what you need to think about tonight. You say, well, why, why would not the angel be a part of giving of the New Testament or the new, of the, uh, the new Covenant? Well, the Old Covenant was written in stone. It was written in stone by the finger of God. It was the law of God given forth from the Lord by the disposition of angels. It was something that could be seen. It was something that could be felt, could be held. It was something that could be witnessed. But the New Covenant, the New Testament, is not written in stone. The New Testament is written in the heart and soul of the believer. And it's written in such a fashion that the angels aren't even sure about what's going on. Look over here in First Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 2. In 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 2. 1 Peter 1, 2. Let's see. 12, rather. 1 Peter 1, 12. I need to wipe my glasses off. I can read better. Amen. 1 Peter 1, 12. Now watch this. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you, by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Watch this. Which things the angels desire to look into. See how they're excluded from the giving of the new birth? They're excluded from understanding it? How could they? How could they? You see, the new covenant is the new birth. The new covenant is to write your name in the Lamb's book of life and is to restore the image of of, the, of, of, cry, of, 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 of God that was lost in the first Adam. That's a big deal. That image now has been restored. But you see, an angel is not made in the image of God. And angels are not born again. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that an angel is born again, or does it ever say an angel was made in the image of God. Notice carefully, when Christ came into the world, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, He took not on Him the nature of angels, but he took upon him the seed of Abraham. Abraham was a full-blown human being. And every one of us that believe tonight believe in the same faith that Abraham had. The promise given before the law was ever given. So the first justification of a man on the face of this earth, he was justified by believing God through the promise before the law. Notice. His salvation was justification before the law. The angel could be, per, could be involved in the giving of the law and the first covenant and all of that because it's visible. It's physical. It has to do with what the man does in his service and relationship to God. But when it comes to the, to the, to the New Testament, the new covenant, the angel can only stand back in awe and desire to look into those things which are above and beyond him. Can you imagine what Satan's doing? Do you think Satan has a clue what the new birth is about? You know when you read in the book of Galatians, it says that Abraham had two sons. He had one by a, ha by a, by a bondwoman, Hagar. He had another one by his wife, the seed of promise, Isaac. The Bible says the one that is born of the bondwoman persecuted the one who was born of the promise. In plainer words, it goes even further to say, the one that is born after the flesh 
persecuted the one born of the Spirit or after the promise. There's a great contrast then between religion on one hand and the new birth on the other. The new birth is an enigma, folks. It's an enigma wrapped up in a riddle that can never be understood except by those who are born again. Religion to this very day will persecute those that are born of the Spirit of God. I remember hearing a man high in his religion saying, We got these newborn or newborns over here talking about their new birth, whatever that means. I appreciate his honesty. I really do. Because he does not have a clue what it means to be born again. If you have been, you do. And you don't get that from something written in stone. Your new birth testifies to the new birth of another believer by the spirit that dwells within you. And this is the great contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant of the book of Hebrews. For the Old Covenant, the apostle says, has passed away. It's weak. It was dying when it was given. But the New Covenant has been ratified and brought into effect, not by the life of Aaron and his sons who lived out their time and they died, but it is brought into effect and is maintained by one who has an endless life. Yes. The priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So the great truth is today that there are those in this world that people will never understand. They'll never understand them. They they can't define it. The best they can ever say is, well, he's had some kind of an emotional experience. He or she's had, you know, some kind of this or that. They don't know. And the reason they don't know is they never will know until that image has been restored in them as it has been in us. I know whom I have believed. I know that I've passed from death, life into death. And I know my Savior. I know the new birth. For I went 27 years without it. And then the day came when I bowed my head, lost and unsaved, and raised it anew in a brand new world, born of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah to the Lord. So the contrast is great. And it's great because you cannot drag elements of the Old Law or the Old Testament over into the New Testament. You just can't do it. Now look at Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse number 1. Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse number 1. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, Scripture makes a remarkable statement here. Here's what it says. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on in a perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Let me say something to you tonight, and I want to say it as simple as I know how. There are those who are teaching that all you have to do is believe the gospel and pray the sinner's prayer, and you're going to be saved. They say that repentance is a work. Let me tell you something. If you have true saving faith, real saving faith, you're going to repent. Don't put the cart before the horse. It is not a work. It is a manifestation of saving faith. If you truly have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and accepted Him as your Savior, you will repent. And your repentance won't be a one-time thing. It will only begin at the new birth. And it will continue on as the Holy Spirit shines His light on things in your life that need to get right. But you will repent. My goodness, folks, I've repented for weeks and weeks and weeks after I got never did so much repenting in my life. As I did after I got saved. I was repenting all over the place. And the reason I was because there was an awful lot of stuff God was digging up. We call that sanctification. The sanctification, the setting apart into the service of the Lord, into God's ownership of the saint of God. You will repent. And if you go and if you try to fight that do- doctrine and try to come along and say this idea, well, I just simply believe and everything's okay. What do you mean believe? Intellectual belief won't get you into the kingdom. And I'm, a, I'm afraid an awful lot of people have prayed intellectual prayers. And it produced no fruit because it produced no repentance. Amen. Amen. Repentance and fruit go hand in hand. Can't have one without the other. So the apostle over here says this in Hebrews 6. He said, Of the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment, and this will we do if God permit So he says there's something that we're going to do after we get saved. Now notice what he compares that with. Look at verse number 1 again. He said, from dead works and of faith toward God. So what's dead works, preacher? Dead works is the best an unsaved man can do to try to please God. 
but it's still dead works. If it's not wrought by the power of the Spirit of God Almighty, it's going to be dead. Life doesn't come from what you produce. You cannot produce life. I don't care how sincere you are, how hard you work at it, give your body to be burned, give your own blood, and offer yourself up to be, to be crucified. It will not produce one single spiritual thing. It must first come from God. And that is the key to understanding the difference between dead works and faith and the fruit of the Spirit. For the fruit of the Spirit is a wonderful thing. And the fruit of the Spirit lifts in joy and puts power in the soul of the believer. The fruit of the Spirit is a marvelous thing. And it gives you, it gives you, that, it gives you that what you know inside your soul, this is not coming from me. This is bigger than I am. <laughs> this is greater than my ability. There's somebody inside me is a whole lot bigger than I am. And that's the fruit of the Spirit. Now that's contrasted with the works of the flesh. And the works of the flesh, he enumerates them, many of them, adultery, fornication, lying, deceiving, all this other stuff, uh, lasciviousness, these are the works of the flesh. So when we come at this and we, we, we begin to look at what the Bible's talking about here in Hebrews, it's literally saying, we're not going to talk about what goes on outside. He said, I want to talk to you about what's going on inside. Religion cleans up the cup. It whitewashes the sepulchers. It hands out accolades and, 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 and awards and, 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 it's, and, it, and, it's, and it sets the people apart above the other people. And it makes them a standard for the other people to live up to. That's religion. Salvation is a work that's wrought in the heart on the inward man inside. Now I want you to look at the book of Romans chapter number 1. And I want you to look at this as compared to that conscience we're talking about in the book of Hebrews where he says, the comers there too could never have a perfect conscience. Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, be careful with this, because this is one of those, those warnings in the Bible that you better take note of. When it talks about a reprobate mind, that's powerful talk. That's a strong statement. Here's a reprobate mind, verse 32. It defines it right here. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have, well, look at this word. Does your Bible say pleasure? Pleasure in them that do them. They have completely cast God out of their life and out of their mind. As far as they're concerned, they're no longer accountable to God. He doesn't matter. It doesn't mean a thing to them. That's a reprobate mind. Now, the Greek word is a dokimos. It means the inability to differentiate between right and wrong. In plainer words, they call evil good and good evil. This is what's going on in the culture today. You've seen it manifest and spread all over the place just in the last few months. It's everywhere. These are people with reprobate minds. I'm not saying all of them are. And the reason I don't say that is this. There's every reason to believe that once you've reached a state of a reprobate mind, you're irretrievable. You're gone. This is why the Bible said God gave them over. I'm done with you. That's what that means. He gave them over. I'm finished with you. Oh, I wouldn't want God to say he's finished with me. Oh, I wouldn't want to go into a prayer closet and shut the door and get on my face. And it'd be so dead and so cold and so dark and no hope and no prayer and no spirit and no desire to even pray anymore. No, no, don't care about God. Don't care about anything. That's a reprobate mind. You don't get there overnight. You don't get there overnight. Notice it says, who knowing the judgment of God. It's someone who knew. They knew the judgment of God. They knew what God said about their lifestyle. They knew. They knew exactly what was going on. In the book of Romans chapter number 1, it says that they are without excuse for the things, the invisible things of Him are clearly seen. Being manifest by his, by what is it, the eternal, his eternal power and Godhead. What is it? the creation? The creation 
to everybody but a fool. When they look at the creation, they have to stand back in awe and say, My goodness gracious, boy, man, there's something up there a whole lot bigger than I am. Amen. Have you noticed these uh, pictures they send back of, this, of the, uh, the, the spacecraft up there? You know, they'll, they'll take a photograph of Earth out here in space. You know, this big, beautiful ball floating around out here in space. You know, I think it's quite a remarkable. It's a beautiful thing. It's beautiful. And, uh, but I haven't seen a man on there yet. Have you? Best you can do is make out an ocean or a continent. But a little speck like me, that would be something to see me from space, wouldn't it? What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm little. <laughs> I'm a little, little, I'm a little small, infinitesimal speck walking around on this earth. And yet, he loved me. Amen. And he gave himself for me. Amen. And I love him. Oh, how I do. I bless his righteous name tonight and love him. I'm glad, folks. I was standing at the precipice. I was at the edge. I knew the judgment of God about a lot of things. But thank God I hadn't reached the state of reprobacy. And when I heard that voice speaking to my soul, <laughs> I heard him. Boy, did he ever shake up my world. Have you ever had your world shaken up? You know what I'm talking about. Have you ever had somebody come into your life that just got your attention? And, and, and from that moment on, the only thing you could think about was the one that came into your life? That's conviction. That was conviction. And he came into my life and convicted me. He convicted me. And when he convicted me, he converted me. And he didn't convict me, save he was going to convert me. He convicted me. Has he ever convicted you? Oh my, what a thing. You'll never be ashamed of him. You'll be proud of that day. You'll be glad for that day. You'll rejoice in that day. You might not be able to remember the hour or the day. You know, a lot of folks can, can call out, I was saved on January 13th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon at such and such a place. Well, good for you. I can't remember the time like that, but I can take you to the place. <laughs> they can tear it down, bulldoze the whole street. I can get close because I know what happened to me. <laughs> I know what happened, boy. <laughs> Man, did I ever know. All this stuff that I didn't have any use for was as boring, dead to me. Now all of a sudden I'm so hungry for that. I'm thirsty. I'm, I want to read. I want to read the Bible. I want to pray. I want to be around God's people. I want to go to church. All of that started back there in 1973. Amen. And it does nothing but get sweeter every day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And that's truth. Amen. Man being Christ is a new creature. So now, when I pray, if I carry something into my closet and I need to get forgiveness for it, I pray about it, and you know what? I have a clear conscience. You know why? The blood of Christ cleanses that conscience. Now, the Bible says two things about your past. It says, the Apostle Peter said, you have forgotten that you were cleansed, that you were purged from your old sins. But the Apostle Paul said, forgetting those things that are past. Now on the surface of it, it may look like a contradiction, but that's no contradiction. What Peter is saying to you is, don't forget where you came from. But don't live in the past. What Paul is saying, now press on to the mark of the high calling of Christ. Press on to it. Don't let Satan drag you back to where you came from. If he can drag you down, he'll drag you down. He'll beat you to death with what you did 30 years ago. He'll beat you to death with it. Yeah, he will. He'll wear you out. He'll wear you out. He's the accuser of the brethren. Just remember, if you've truly done what God said to do, then your conscience has been cleaned, cleansed by the blood of Christ. That's proof positive that you're under the new covenant and not the old. Because they could never get that under the old. It took the blood of Christ. Did you know the Bible says when Christ died on the cross, He not only died for the sins that I will commit, He died for the sins I have committed. And you know what? 
He died for the sins of all of those people that lived in the Old Testament. For the blood of bulls and goats couldn't pay for that. And he paid for all of it. Bless his righteous name. We got a good God. We got a good God. Hallelujah. He's been good to me. <laughs> Boy. Hallelujah. I got up here tonight and I was tired. But Lord, I, he does it every time. He just fires me up, pumps me up with something. And I think, hallelujah to God. Amen. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Bless your people. Bless those watching by the internet right now and those that will watch this later. Bless them, Father, of the sweet Holy Spirit. You're our life, Lord. You're our life. You are our life. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.